I, I remember hearing this story and it left me with a picture, a visual. During the war in France, there was an office, I don't know whether it was by um, the Hayas, the Joint, for Jewish affairs, for helping people. And of course, it was so chaotic in the war years that uh, there wasn't really much anybody could do. There was one man who worked in the office and he uh, later related that during that time, a young man came in and asked when he could have an appointment. And they said, it's, it's chaotic, they can't really predict. He said, when should I come back? Because I have to schedule my day. And he hadn't heard that in a long time. Nobody was scheduling a day. You, you know, you lived from minute to minute. It left an impression on him. Somebody was still conducting their lives as if things were normal. So years and years later, he discovered that that young man became the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The, the visual of it, the picture of it, the Rebbe's calm, the Rebbe's purposefulness, in a time when everything was crazy. And it led me to think that we've known from the beginning of history that the world is not the best, most comfortable, most godly, uh, safest, painless of all, of all the worlds. In fact, it's the lowest of all worlds. And it's our job to elevate the world, to turn the darkness into light, the bitterness into sweet, and so on. So from the beginning of history, uh, Adam and Chava found a tree in the Garden of Eden. It needed work because it wasn't kosher, so they went to work on it. They ate from the tree, they struggled with it, their children struggled with it and we're struggling with it until today. But we're fighting the fight. So when things went bad, we simply said, okay, this job is harder than we thought. And we continue to work at elevating the world. A number of ah. times in history, things became so bad, events were so devastating, that we, we threw up our hands and we said, we can't do this. This world is very bad. It's not going to get better. And we quit for about a generation, sometimes two. But after that, we went back to work. Got to fix the world, got to elevate it, got to bring out the good, got to discourage the bad, make the world godly. And we worked at it for a while and then something happened and it knocked us out. Worse than anything we could possibly imagine and we were discouraged and we quit. But after a while, went back to work. How do you do that? Only if you know in advance that we are here to fix the world. We're not here for vacation. This is not a retirement home. We are here to fix the lowest of all worlds. Sometimes we are shocked by how low low can be. How bad can bad be? And for a while it knocks us out and we're helpless and we're, we lose, lose our direction, but we always regain our footage and, and we go back to work. So we begin with the assumption, things are not good. All is not well in paradise. We are not here to enjoy the beauty of the world. We are here to create the beauty of the world. 
So the darker and the uglier things get, the harder we work at it. That's the idea of bringing good out of bad. In other words, the assumption is the world was bad and we need to fix it, not the world was good and we ruined it. That's one of the reasons it's so painful to hear people, even some rabbis, who will jump at every tragedy. They will jump at the opportunity to blame somebody, to blame the pain, the suffering on somebody's misbehavior. We're doing something wrong and we're being punished. So let's at least, at least clear this away. It is not our job and it's not our place to condemn people, to accuse people, or even to accept charges that people are guilty and punishable and so on. Because right at the beginning of the Torah, when the first Jew comes on the scene, and that is Avraham, one of the first things we learn about Avraham is that when God said to him, the people of Sodom are exceedingly evil. I'm going to destroy them. Now, Avraham was a believer in one God, a true believer. Shouldn't he have said to God, <laughs> yeah, do, do your thing, you're God, whatever you say. Avraham didn't say that. He said, that bad? You mean there aren't 50 good people? Okay, 45? Uh, 35? He argued in their defense, which is really why God told him in the first place. Why does God have to report to him what he's about to do? So Avraham took the message, got the message. God is telling him because somebody has to defend people. So when God says you are guilty and therefore deserve punishment, we're supposed to say no. We're not that bad. God doesn't need you to approve. And how do we see this in, in everyday life? God says, when you see someone hungry, feed him. Who made him hungry? God. So why would I interfere? Let God run the world. May God's will be done. No. Our job is to feed people who are, who are hungry. Our job is to heal people who are sick. Our job is to save people who are in danger. Our job is to clothe those who don't have clothes. We're not here to help God when it comes to human suffering. Only God is allowed to do that. We have to argue in favor. If we can't feed and save, then at least defend. So for a, a Jew to say, yes, we deserve this, God forbid, that is not our place. And as the Debra once pointed out, don't compare yourself to the prophets of old. Because many of the prophets warned the Jews, if you don't get your act together, if you don't stop worshiping idols, if you don't stop sinning, you're going to suffer such and such punishment. So you see, it's a Jewish thing to do. The Debra said, no, it's not a Jewish thing to do unless you're a prophet. A prophet is someone who God chooses to deliver God's message to the people. The prophet is never giving his own opinion. In fact, it's very likely that even as the prophet was saying, you're going to deserve punishment, he didn't really believe it for a minute. Because he didn't see Jews being bad. But a prophet must say what he is told to say. So they said it. 
they didn't wish it on anybody. So if you're not a prophet and you're not told to say it, why would you volunteer? In addition to that, it is a, a, a desecration of God's name, of God's reputation, to even suggest that at this point in history, any Jew deserves punishment. Because if you just make a simple calculation, God is just at the very least. So if there is reward and punishment, it is applied with careful justice. Judgment. And that means take, in, take into consideration the circumstances. So let's look at the circumstances. When did God ask us to be his people? When did God ask us to accept his Torah and his commandments? 3,332 years ago, on a mountain in Sinai. Since then, we haven't heard from him. Not a word. 3,300 years. He wrote the Torah down for us and said, read it from time to time and do what you got to do. And never spoke to us again. It's a miracle that we even know that we're Jewish, that we want to be Jewish, that we tell our children we are Jews. We made a commitment to God 3,300 years ago, and we're not giving up on it. So as far as revelation, inspiration, uh, reliving the event at Sinai, only in our minds and hearts. So already it's a miracle, and already we deserve a lot of credit. Add to that the last 2,000 years. Impossible, impossible years. We had a few good weekends, <laughs> but generally it was, it was inhumane, impossible. And that's why all thinkers in the non-Jewish world would marvel at how Jews are still Jewish and they're still here. So after the Holocaust, can there be an accusation against any Jew? Uh, some rabbis suggested that this, this pandemic and all the shuls closed, God is telling us something, they said. He doesn't want us in shul. He's had it with us. He wants us to go to our rooms like bad boys and think about what we did wrong and not come out until we've improved. That, that is so unthinkable. And it's coming from some terrible frustration in the people who say it, or maybe just a bad habit of always attributing every pain to sin and punishment, which is so not Jewish. Can God possibly be disappointed with us? Can God possibly find us wanting, even deserving of punishment? It's unthinkable. Any Jew today deserves only credit, only reward, only admiration. How do you still know you're Jewish? Why do you still care? God has given us so many reasons to just quit. Give it up. Don't even consider giving it up. 
and the sins that we're committing? When you don't hear from God for 3,000 years, when you go through 2,000 years of disruption, of evil, this, uh, exile from this country, from that country, and then topped off by a holocaust, Whose fault is it that we're not perfect? Certainly not our fault. The miracle of our, of our persistence has got to be the ultimate miracle of the universe. So let's get that out of the way. This is not punishment. We don't deserve punishment. God would never even think of having complaints against his people at this point in history. So what then are we seeing? So let's, let's, let's take a, a look. People ask, is there a silver lining? Yeah, there's always a silver lining. But here we have something much more than that. You remember when this thing began, <clears throat> this, this lockdown? The, the thought of being alone with our families in the house for 24 consecutive hours was frightening. For an indefinite amount of time, we're going to be home with the kids, no school? Oh, this is not going to be pretty. <laughs> it, it can't work. We're going to go crazy. And couples who are not getting along fabulously, some even on the verge of divorce, and now they, they're stuck with each other in the house. The experts, the, the officials were saying the, uh, the domestic violence is going to go through the roof. Thankfully, that did not happen. For the most part, with few exceptions, for the most part, people love being home. Children love being home. They get along with each other. They get along with their parents. And couples who are on the verge of divorce suddenly found themselves reassessing. Why are you allowed to go on Zoom every time? Suddenly, they're looking good to each other. Suddenly, they're grateful to have each other. It was really nice to hear. So what exactly happened? When we look back, just two months ago, the reality that we were living with, which we considered normal, is that you got to get out of the house. You got to get away from the kids, or you got to get them out of the house. And you got to get away from each other. Don't spend so much time together. Go take a trip, get on a jet plane, leave town, uh, go out to eat, go out for sports, go out for entertainment, go to work, just get away. And when we were told we would spend time together, we were horrified. Looking back, that was pretty scary. We were actually living that way. So, this is how we were living with dread of our own family, <laughs> with a desperate need to get out of the house every day and spend the vast bigger part of the day away from family that was normal boy looking back at it it's like what is wrong with us and then when you went to work you called it making a living you weren't making a living you were escaping from life so now we have had time to um to reflect on things and we've discovered, much to our amazement, that you can live without shopping. You can live without entertainment. You can live without travel. 
You can even live without going to work and without sending kids to school. Because all of that is just commentary. Life is at home. Life is family. Life is your purpose in the world. So even if you have no family and you were completely alone, I heard from some people who before Yontif, before Pesach, they were dreading the Seder night. What are they going to do? Make a Seder by yourself? That's ridiculous. What, are you going to ask yourself the four questions? You're going to sit there and drink wine? How meaningful could that possibly be? And besides, they had no idea. How do you make a Seder? They never made a Seder. They were always at Zadie's or at Chabad House or at a public Seder. After Yantif, they called to say, a few of them, and I'm sure it's true of many, pleasantly surprised. They felt very alone but at the same time, they felt significant. They made a Seder to the best of their ability. Somebody actually told me they didn't have any matzah. They hadn't even thought to have matzah, but they had some rice cakes. So they made a Seder on the rice cakes. Now tell me that God wasn't absolutely faklemt. 3,000 years later, after 2,000 years of suffering, a guy is sitting all by himself. Nobody's watching. Nobody's telling him. Nobody's going to report. And he makes a Seder to the best of his abilities, knowing that it's probably not the right way. But not make a Seder? when God is expecting one, they actually said they felt that God appreciated what they were doing. That's Jewish thinking. So what happened here? We found out where life really takes place. We found out that there's no need to run from your family we found out that the individual actually counts. The, so, the, the shuls are closed. The synagogues are closed. God is telling us, I don't need big numbers. Judaism is not a culture. It's not a community affair. It's you. You. The reason a minion is so valuable is because it's a minion of significant individuals. If the individual is not significant, then 10 of them is just 10 times zero. Like that famous joke about, the guy says, I bought this watch at cost. Not wholesale, cost. So somebody said, well, the guy who's selling the watches, how does he make a living if he sells everything at cost? He says, oh, the volume. <laughs> he sells many of them. No matter how many times you multiply zero, it's still zero. So the only reason a minion has any significance is because every one of those 10 has their own significance. God is reminding us, you count even when you're alone in your apartment and you don't know how to make a Seder. It's you. So is that a silver lining or is that pure gold? I think it's pure gold. I think God has so much pleasure from our devotion, from our simple, sincere, no fanfare, no public no, uh, acknowledgement. Nobody knows what you did at home, but you were a Jew being Jewish. 
how could God not love that? And how could we have forgotten that? Now, where we go? We got to hope that we're not going back to the old way. We discovered, among other things, that kids left to their own love to learn. Kids who don't do well in school, they're not good students, they're not learners. Turns out they are. The school is just not helpful. So are we going to go back to the schools as they used to be? Can't. We're going to go back to work the way work used to be? You remember? <laughs> you remember work? Remember the workplace? Remember the office? It's a place full of tension, anxiety, greed, competition. Everybody's popping pills, antidepressants. You want to go back to that? We should never have gotten to that. How, how did we even think that that was normal, acceptable lifestyle? And that's what took us out of our families? For that we left our homes every day? We're not going back to that. Can't. Can't. It's not humane. So what will we replace it with? I don't know. But it's got to be a lot better. A lot better because it has to compensate for all the pain. This can't be for nothing. So the workplace of tomorrow has got to be a place where people get together to help each other, not just win-win. We're going to work to help others, not greedy, not selfish, not competitive, mutual cooperation. Why else would we go to work? Why else would God arrange a universe in which human beings can't just go out and find food? No, they have to go to kindergarten. Then they have to go to grade school and then high school and then college and then graduate school and then hopefully find a job and then make enough money to be able to feed your family. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Why did God do that? There's got to be a meaningful reason, not just desperation, to not die from hunger. The reason we need to go to work is so that we would meet people, so that the world would become a small and intimate place. So your job takes you across the sea to another culture, to another language to meet people you would never otherwise meet and not to rip them off, not to get a good deal. You're meeting people that you would never have met because somehow you can help them or they can help you and goodness can flourish. So we should go to work with that intention. I'm leaving the house to help somebody, to make the world better for everyone. That makes sense. The way we lived until now, well, we've lost our minds. Why would we, why would we sub subject ourselves to such, such impossible circumstance, conditions? Every day you go to work, you dread it, you have to be nasty, you have to be selfish, you got to think of yourself, put yourself first. Where is this coming from? So here's the lesson, the conclusion. We have discovered 
life is not here for us to um, for us to satisfy our needs. Because I don't know if you noticed, but our needs are not getting taken care of very well. And the sages told us a long time ago, you want to satisfy your needs? No one satisfies even half their needs before their life is over. So satisfying your need is not the goal. And if you don't satisfy all your needs, you have not failed because that is not our purpose. Our purpose is to serve the creator who created a very low world that needs a lot of attention and a lot of fixing. And that's what we've been doing. And that's what we will continue to do until the world becomes holier than heaven from the lowest, from the worst to the best. Because when you turn darkness into light, when you turn the bitter into sweet, then the sweet is intensely sweet. And the light is pure light. So now we're going to watch. Here's the prediction. Before Mashiach comes, the effect of the tree of knowledge of good and evil has to be healed and, and corrected. The tree of knowledge, good and evil, is when goodness and darkness got mixed together like a chont. In every goodness, there's a little evil. In every evil, there's a little goodness. And that makes it so hard, so confusing. Before Mashiach comes, we will have increase the goodness in the world to where the balance is so in favor of the holy and the good that that mixture can't continue and they get sorted out. The evil becomes blatant, raw, unapologetic evil. And the good becomes pure, selfless, altruistic, beautiful goodness. Now take a look at the news and you'll see that's exactly what's happening. The good and the bad are no longer mixing. They're polarizing. The bad people have no apology. They're not ashamed. They don't regret. It's pure evil. And what happens when you take the little bit of good out of the evil? It can't survive. And just to make it really clear, God sends us this thing called a virus. A virus. A virus is different from a bacteria. Bacteria is living organisms. Some of them are bad, but some are good. You have good bacteria. And that's why you shouldn't overdo it with the antibiotics because they start to kill off the good bacteria. There's good cholesterol, and there's bad cholesterol. But there's no such thing as good virus. Because any form of life is good, even if it's being abused or misused like bad bacteria. A virus is not alive. It's not a living organism. It's, it's a parasite. It steals life from, from living organisms, like in this case, from your lungs. So look at what a lifeless little thing that has no excuses for its own existence. There is no good in it whatsoever. But look at the damage it can do. To fight that, to heal from that, the antidote, I'm not talking medically, but um, morally, 
The antidote is be more alive. Don't let lifeless little monsters, microscopic little monsters, don't let them interfere with your life. Don't let them compromise your life. Don't give an inch. If you start to worry, you're giving in a little bit. If you become pessimistic, it's winning. If you panic, you've given up the fight. The only response is more enthusiasm for life. A person who is completely alive in every part of his body, the virus can't get to him. That's why people who are what the doctors call compromised, they're vulnerable because there's some place where life is not living fully in your body or in, or in your emotions or something, and that's where the virus can get in. Maybe that's why children who are so enthusiastic about life and have not yet been compromised, they seem to be immune. So people sometimes say, you know, you're, you're way too, you're way too, uh, too upbeat. This is a terrible thing. This is a horrible thing. People, I, I know, don't support it. Don't feed it. Don't even, you know, when you're fully alive, you don't leave room for lifelessness, not even in your vocabulary. We're careful with what we say. Because if you introduce the, the negative, even in, in just words, you're giving it a hold. You're giving it some hospitality. You don't want to do that. None. And here's a story that I heard, which was absolutely amazing. Heard it as a teenager. You know the history of Chabad in Russia. The previous Rebbe declared war on communism. He didn't want to escape communism. He wanted to destroy it. It was such an evil, such an unholy, ungodly thing. It had to be destroyed. And he, he drafted his chassidim into an army to defeat communism. Many chassidim gave their lives in this battle. It hasn't been written up properly in the history books, but someday it will. The most difficult part of the battle was psychological. The communists were fighting a psychological war against believers, against people with, with a philosophy other than communism. So many chassidim who survived the gulags, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, 20 years, and they were not broken. With all the brilliant uh, manipulation psychological warfare that, that the Russians were so good at. They couldn't break them. So just a quick little story. One of the chassidim, Mendel, was in, a, was in a, a, a gulag, in a labor camp, and the guard told him that another chassid had been arrested and brought to the, and he was in the, in the, in the cell under the floor under Mendel's. And that if he spoke quietly at night into the opening in the floor where the heat pipe ran, they could communicate. So at night, Mendel said to the chassid under him, if I'm not mistaken, it was a guy named Moshe. Mendel said, Moshe, can you hear me? And Moshe said, who is this? And he said, it's Mendel. Are you zufrieden? Are you content? <laughs> what a question to ask a guy who was just arrested, 
who may never, who may not survive, may never see his family again. He may die of hunger, of exposure, of murder by 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 the officials or by the prisoners. Or and he's asking him, "Are you content?" <laughs> Ridiculous. But as I got older, I understood. If you're going to survive, and they won't be able to get to you psychologically, mentally, emotionally, you can't give an inch. If you're not content to be here, they already have an advantage over you. They're content. They like their job. But you don't like what you're doing here because you don't belong here, right? You're at a disadvantage. You're not going to survive. To survive, you have to live your life as if nothing wrong has ever happened. God sent you here. This is your purpose, the mission, the reason your soul came down to earth. You are here. You're content to be here because you're Jewish and whatever God wants is fine with you. And the, the, uh, the communist who's going to interrogate you, not interested in him. You're not intimidated by him. You're not discouraged by him. You're not even objecting to being here. So now you're on an even playing field. He does his thing, I do mine. He's happy to do his job, I'm happy to do mine. Now play games with my brain. <laughs> These were amazing people. And that's how they survived. So, we can't allow a lifeless, microscopic little monster to get us thinking negative. Tragedy is tragedy. That's not, that's not the point. But the tragedy is going to deprive us of life. We're alive. We're going to live better. We're going to live more. We're going to be more enthusiastic about life, not less. And then, if a microscopic little lifeless creature can do so much damage, now we have no more doubts. A microscopic mitzvah, one person by himself in an apartment on Pesach, who sits down to make a Seder, not really knowing what he's doing or she's doing. It's going to be a micro mitzvah. And that's not important. We now know a micro mitzvah can fix the entire world much more than a micro virus can destroy the world. So our micro mitzvahs are going to overcome the microviruses, and we're going to come out healthier, stronger, wiser, and certainly more mature. The world is going to be a much better world. That's not a silver lining, that's pure gold.